Welcome to Lucena Research's webinar. We're going to talk about statistical machine learning and its application to price forecasting. Now before I get started, I have to tell you, make a few disclaimers. Uh, first of all, Lucena Research is not, uh, does not provide investing advice. Uh, if you do want investing advice, please uh, consult a, a certified professional. We're going to show you examples that are hypothetical. Uh, please don't assume that these methods will be profitable. And as I said, uh, what we're going to show is hypothetical methods uh, looking back at history. And as you know, previous performance is not predictive of future performance. Let me tell you a little bit about uh, Lucena Research. Uh, Lucena Research is a uh, Georgia Tech spinoff. We're located in the heart of Atlanta on Peachtree Street. Uh, I list uh, our three principles here, but uh, we're a group of uh, 10 developers, uh, quantitative analysts, and uh, investment professionals uh, uh, who uh, have built this company. And I'm going to show you some details of our product, QuantDesk, which is uh, the product of our labors. That's me. I'm Tucker Balch. I'm an associate professor at Georgia Tech. I teach courses there about AI and uh, finance. I've been a consultant for a uh, number one online broker and also worked as a quant at a hedge fund. And now I'm CTA at uh, Lucena Research. Uh, overall, we're looking uh, to finish up in about 40 minutes. We're going to start with an introduction to statistical machine learning and talk about how that can make sense for investing. We're going to give you an uh, overview of our product, QuantDesk, and show you uh, how we can use statistical machine learning within QuantDesk, and we'll demonstrate that to you uh, as well. We'll also be happy to take uh, questions at the end and uh, look, forward to, uh, look forward to interesting questions from you. Okay, so let's, let's think about the market overall. Uh, if, uh, if you consider that in North America there's 13,000 securities trading, uh, and perhaps uh, we might have quanti 120 or so quantitative measures on each security, and there's 250 trading days per year. That means looking over a five-year period, there's nearly 2 billion data points. It's nearly impossible for a single person to process all that information and use it uh, to make investing choices and, and forecast prices. And that's where machine learning uh, comes in and where machine learning can help. What is machine learning? So machine learning, uh, a, a broad definition is it's the construction and study of systems that can learn from data. Uh, machine learning is used by Facebook to recognize faces. It's used by Netflix to recommend uh, movies for you. And it can also be used in finance and uh, in investing. The Across all applications, there's two major uses for machine learning. One is classification, where we try to decide, hey, here is some data. What is that thing? That's classification. Another use is regression, where we have some observation about something, for instance, uh, uh, important factors about a stock, and we want to make a numerical prediction. That's called regression. So here's a, uh, here's a block diagram of, of one way to think about uh, machine learning. Uh, so we always start with data, and that might be, uh, with regard to stocks, uh, historical values of factors that we think are important to future prices. Uh, and we also need what those future prices ended up to be so that we can build a model. So that data feeds into a machine learning algorithm, and out comes a model. And what a model is, is something simply that can take observations, we call those X, run through the model and make a prediction, we call that Y. Now let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. We'll do it in the context of weather. Um, this data is, uh, is, is made up, uh, but I think it, it provides a decent example. Now 
let's suppose that we observe a change in barometric pressure um, and then we see how much rain occurs today. Now, most folks know that if you see a big drop in barometric pressure, that usually predicts rain. So each dot here represents, okay, on a particular day, the barometric pressure either went up this much or down that this much, and then we saw this much rain. So each dot represents one observation, one day. I've colored the days where there wasn't much rain, red, and I've colored the days where there was more rain, uh, green. And as you can see, there's a, a, a kind of pattern here. Uh, if you sort of step back and squint, we see uh, a pattern that, that looks uh, something like this. Now there's uh, noise in this data. For instance, something like this and something like this. In other words, the, the data we observe isn't, doesn't fit this line perfectly. Uh, it's noisy. And, and we don't know for sure really what the underlying principle is. And that noise uh, can sometimes confuse machine learning techniques. Now, here's a couple ways that we can use to try and solve this problem. In other words, uh, if we observe a certain change in barometric pressure, how much rain are we going to get today? A classic method is called a parametric model. And one of the most popular ways to build a parametric model is linear regression. And that is, let's fit a line to the data. And what we need to do to build a model in that case is find out what is M and what is B. And now we have a decent predictor for, hey, if the barometric pressure goes down this much, we'll probably get about this much rain. But observe, it, it, it doesn't fit the data well here and, uh, and here. Now we can have a more complex uh, parametric model, polynomial models, are, uh, are popular. Uh, we have to figure out a few more parameters in this case. Um, and in the end, the, the model really is just uh, three numbers, this M, that M, and uh, B. And here's, uh, here's what that model looks like. It fits this area really nicely, but not so well over here. Now there's a, a whole other set of ways to model data called data-driven. And this is, what, uh, this is what we use at Lucena. Uh, a lot of folks uh, believe in data-driven models. I'll explain. I'll explain why. Uh, let's say we we're, we observe today that the barometric pressure has gone down this much, and we want to query and see hmm, what's our what's our prediction for today. Well, one way to do that is okay. Let's let's look uh, let's look nearby. Uh, let's look at the points nearby, and then we can just take their mean, and that is our prediction for today. Now we can query at all the different points and get a more complete model. And here's what that looks like. And notice how we end up with a model that seems to fit the data nicely, both over here and here, in ways that the that the other that the parametric models didn't do so great. So uh, comparing those two approaches and uh, uh, don't worry, we'll get to stocks in, a, in just a moment. <laughs> um, parametric models uh, are nice in the sense that they, they don't overfit. And what overfitting means is sometimes models really predict noise as opposed to the underlying principle that we're trying to observe. And parametric models have a feature that they don't do that uh, too often. They also are very fast at runtime. When you're trying to do, make a prediction right now, parametric models work, uh, work nicely. Problem with them, though, is they don't fit complex data that well, and sometimes perhaps they oversimplify. On the other hand, uh, data-driven models can model complex data well, as you can see with that uh, rain example. Um, and as we uh, add more and more data, and this is something that's important for uh, in the market, you know, each day we get perhaps uh, hundreds of millions of uh, more data points. It's very easy to add that to a data-driven model uh, and perhaps a little bit more difficult with the uh, parametric models. Uh, a con of data-driven models, sometimes they're a little bit slow at runtime because it takes a lot of number crunching. Uh, and in some cases, data-driven models may uh, overfit and match noise as opposed to uh, the underlying function. OK, we can do this in many more dimensions than just uh, that one-dimensional example. Uh, you know, if going back to 
to the weather example, yes, if barometric pressure drops, we're likely to see rain, but there's also got to be some humidity for us to see rain. So this is now a more complex example where we've got uh, barometric pressure and humidity. And again, I color green dots where we had rain and red dots where we didn't. To make a, a query in this example, we observe the pressure and the humidity today. We look at the nearby points and then make our prediction based on that. This is an approach called uh, K nearest neighbor, which is a classic data-driven machine learning method that we, that we use for stocks. Now, I gave some examples with weather, but we can do the same sorts of things with uh, factors relating to stocks. So in the same way that barometric pressure and humidity can predict rainfall, things like PE ratio and news can uh, predict future price of stocks. And in fact, we can have many more dimensions than just these two, uh, depending on which factors we think are important. Uh, here's one example of what that kind of data looks like. Uh, we took uh, the, each dot there represents uh, one of the stocks in the S&P 500, and we measured uh, three factors, uh, their correlation with the S&P 500, their uh, beta with the S&P 500, and uh, a stochastic uh, technical indicator, and that defines where they are in this uh, three-dimensional space. And we colored them according to uh, what their return was several days later. Uh, blue being that they went down and, and red meaning that they went up. And as you can see, uh, up in this corner of the space, uh, the equities tended to go down. And as we move out in this direction, we see individual uh, equities that, that went up uh, several days later. So we can apply these same, same ideas that I mentioned for perhaps predicting the weather to perhaps predicting future stock prices. Now, um, there's a lot of, that opens up a lot of questions. One, which, which factors matter? And that is, uh, uh, that's, an, that's a deep question. Um, uh, a lot of folks have opinions about which factors matter. And these can, these can be with regard to technical indicators like Bollinger Bands. Uh, many people, uh, don't believe in technical analysis, but they believe in fundamental analysis. Uh, in either case, uh, as long as we can measure something quantitative about a stock, we can use those factors uh, in a statistical machine learning model. Uh, our platform, QuantDesk, allows you to tell us which factors you believe are important. If you're a fundamental uh, investor, uh, you might believe in things like PE ratio uh, or PEG ratios or cash on hand and so on. Uh, we can use uh, those factors. If you're a technical analysis uh, analyst, uh, we, can, we can use Bollinger Bands, moving averages and so on. Uh, and uh, in either case, uh, each week uh, we do a deep analysis to find out which factors are most predictive and we offer those, we offer those uh, uh, up, to our, up to our clients. Uh, there's also this issue of, okay, maybe, uh, maybe we know which factors are important, but there's another question of which data do we use to build the models? Now, for instance, uh, uh, financials perhaps act in a different way than uh, technology. Technology might act in a different way than uh, energy. And uh, so we've got an automated method of grouping stocks together according to the way they behave. So we look for, and, and this, uh, this chart over here on the right uh, shows an example grouping. Uh, we, we, we cluster them together according to uh, how similarly they, they have performed to each other historically. And we infer that, uh, that that sort of relationship will continue in the future. So the models that uh, we build start both with uh, which stocks to group together uh, we also perform a deep analysis each week to figure out which factors are most predictive uh, over the last few months. Uh, and uh, then we put those two things together, the factors that matter and the data that we use to build the model. I'm going to show you now a uh, demonstration of our platform, which uh, again we call uh, QuantDesk. There are 
five uh, key features for Quant Desk. We're going to focus uh, today on Price Forecaster, but we also have a portfolio optimizer that, uh, given a set of equities, uh, will make recommendations for how to allocate your assets uh, between them. Uh, it's a mean variance optimizer. Uh, we also have a, uh, a machine learning best, uh, based technique that can recommend hedges. Now coming soon, uh, we're going we're gonna to add two new features very shortly. Uh, the first here is a, uh, is a back tester. So you can uh, enter a strategy and test it through time. You can test, for instance, how effective our predictive methods are in a back test. And also one that's uh, really, really exciting is this event analyzer, which is uh, somewhat like a, a stock screener where you can tell us particular quantitative features you want to select on, but it'll do it over time and provide a heat map where you can see, uh, gee, when I select stocks over time based on these particular factors, uh, did they go on average go up or down? And we present that data in uh, in, in two different ways. Okay, let me get now to uh, a, the demo of our product. So QuantDesk is a uh, cloud-based application. Uh, so when you uh, fire it up, you're provided uh, interface to it uh, uh, over the web, and it connects uh, to our servers in the cloud. The uh, there are a number of panels up here, uh, five of them. The first one, portfolios, is where you can describe to us uh, lists of stocks and 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 describe your portfolio that we can then use in in, in the other sections. Uh, let me jump to the forecaster here. And all of our panels are set up in the similar way. You select the equities that you want to work with over here. Uh, you then configure whatever details of the uh, of the operation that you want to do in this second panel. And then there's an action button. We provide tabular data here and graphical data down here. So let's, uh, let's do a forecast. Uh, we've selected the Dow 30. Um, we're going to forecast uh, two weeks into the future, and we're going to use three months of data to make that forecast. OK, so up, up here, well, let me start with this chart. This chart represents a forecast for our entire portfolio. So uh, this, this particular portfolio contains all of the Dow 30. This is the historical performance. And this is forward-looking, a forward-looking forecast. The middle line here is uh, our forecast uh, return, and the upper and lower line are the boundaries of our of our confidence intervals. Now, if we if we uh, zoom into a particular stock, let's say, let's look at uh, American Express. We see uh, up here in the tabular portion. Uh, remember, this is a two-week forecast. Uh, price as of close yesterday is uh, 64.65. Uh, our forecasting engine uh, thinks that at the end of two weeks, it'll be up to 67.88. Um, and that's a 5% uh, uh, forecast change. You can sort these forecasts by a number of factors. Uh, you can sort here by uh, forecast change. You could sort by volatility. Uh, and you can also sort, sort by this factor we call confidence. What the uh, confidence is, is uh, remember when we talked earlier about, about uh, K nearest neighbor, where we found the closest matches and then made a, made a forecast based on that. What this measure tells us is uh, of those 30 nearest neighbors, we use 30, uh, how diverse is that? How diverse are those predictions? If, if all of those 30 predictions uh, or those 30 data points are fairly close to one another, we have higher confidence. Now we can we can actually uh, delve into a, a, a bit more detail regarding this confidence. We can actually uh, run a, a quick back test. And let me show you how, how, how that works. Let's select uh, Microsoft 
Microsoft's been quite volatile there. Um, so our forecast is that it's going to go up uh, 0.7%. Um, the the confidence from KNN here is is rated at five stars, but when we run this uh, back test, uh, we only get two stars. Now let me show you what let me show you the details about that. When we run a back test, what we do is we roll back in time to the beginning of our uh, look back period here, which is three months. And we step forward one day at a time, and we allow the system to make a forward forecast, and we record that forecast, and then we check how did it do. So we don't allow the system to look forward in time. We make we have it make a prediction. We look at the uh, forward uh, two-week interval, and we we test that. And down here at the bottom, you can see the uh, you can see the tabular results. So there were 63 predictions, one at each day, and 48 of them were for upward movements and 15 were for downward movements. Uh, here we check in this column, we measure, well, how often was it correct? So of the up, of the downward predictions, it was correct 60% of the time. Of the upward ones, it was correct 33% of the time. Uh, overall, about 53% of the time it was correct. Uh, now, uh, you might think, gee, you're only right 53% of the time. Well, if you think about uh, stock predictions, being 53% <laughs> correct uh, can be pretty good. Um, but uh, as we look across all of these factors, we, we score the back test uh, using a number of factors. And in this case, for Microsoft, uh, our, our, uh, our forecastability using this particular model, we only get a rating of two stars. Now here are all the factors we take into consideration when we score that back test. Uh, some of the uh, key ones here are, did the actual price meet or exceed the predicted price? Did the actual price over that period of time touch the predicted price? Uh, and did we get the direction correct? And these are the, these are the weightings that we uh, use for each of those factors. Let's look now at a, uh, let's look, let's actually compute the, the back test scores for uh, all of our all the stocks we're looking at, and we'll uh, we'll choose one that uh, that had a little bit more success in back tests, and I'll show you what that looks like. Let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at uh, AT and T. So AT and T. Uh, scored much higher. One reason is because it did uh, substantially better here on uh, on touching the target. Here's one uh, 3M got uh, five stars. As you can see, uh, 3M's been going up uh, steadily and, and, and perhaps uh, uh, given that steady increase, uh, the system was overall uh, saw a pattern there and able to predict uh, better. Uh, got the direction correct on average 68% of the time. Uh, one thing to mention here is uh, some of the underlying statistics we use. Uh, one of the important measures is uh, students t-test. And what that tells us is if you look at our predictions over time, uh, what is the what is the probability that these predictions are not just uh, lucky or due to chance. And uh, anyways, in, in this case, this overall score uh, at 88, uh, 89% is saying that uh, the, the forecasts um, are not very likely to have been due just to, just to chance. Now that's, uh, all of these forecasts I've shown you here are using our default model. Uh, in other words, we run uh, each week uh, uh, about a 10-hour process that looks at all possible combinations of the factors that we might use. And we settled, uh, we settled here on one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, we settled on uh, eight factors. Usually the uh, system finds somewhere between eight and 15 that are the best combination. Uh, and by best, what we mean is over the last uh, month, 
if we had used those factors, we found that they provide the uh, the, the highest quality forecast. Uh, one that's uh, been coming up uh, uh, frequently is days since uh, last quarterly report. Uh, I could speculate about why that is, but uh, uh, it, it, it probably means that, uh, for instance, if a report has just occurred and that number is low, that uh, uh, the the movement of the stock is a little bit more predictive. Or as we're getting close to a quarterly report, maybe there's uh, maybe stocks are more predictive in that case. Uh, anyways, those are those are the factors the system found. But uh, we also provide a means for you to provide your own insight. So let me show you an example here. We can add a new set of factors. Uh, we'll give that a name, our factors. And now we can uh, you can look through all of the various uh, factors we have here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, let's take a look at uh, Golden Cross. That's a particular uh, technical technical factor. And we'll look at um, we'll add uh, Dead Cross as well. And let's try. Let's try also 52 week uh, high and low. Uh, so each one of these factors also has additional uh, additional uh, choices. Of, for instance, uh, on the uh, on the dead cross, there are various parameters for the moving averages that you might select. Uh, you can also select the weighting. You know how important do you believe each of these factors are? Um, so we might have a middle weight for uh, for a 52 week high low. We might have a low weight for a day since dead cross. And uh, let's give this other one a higher weight. Oh, one thing I wanted to uh, remind you: uh, please uh, please post questions, and when we get to the question answer period in a few moments, uh, we'll we'll address those questions. Um, and please. Uh, Please uh, direct those questions. Uh, please use the uh, the chat window for questions. The uh, the the specific way for entering questions. Uh, uh, the the normal way of entering questions for some reason isn't uh, working for us. So please enter them as chat and direct your question to organizers and panelists, and then we'll see those and and we'll address them one at a time. Uh, anyways, we'll get to questions in just a moment. Now, getting back to this uh, creating your own model for forecasting, we've selected three factors here, uh, given them some different weights. Uh, we'll save that. And now, over here, we can select our factors as the model as opposed to default, which is what Lucina provides. OK, and now we can try a forecast using those factors. Okay, so here, here are the results using that that new model that I put together. And again, we can we can uh, run the uh, the back test scorer. Let's take a look, for instance, at uh, looks like looks like the uh, back test for Bank of America is performing well, and we can scroll down and and see those factors. Uh, high percentage of getting uh, direction correct, target touched. So overall, it's getting uh, getting four four stars and a and a high score. Now there are uh, there are other other factors you can change. For instance, you can make a uh, you can forecast say one day all the way out to one month. Of course, uh, we we typically see that. Uh, uh, shorter shorter forecasts um, tend to, uh, uh, often tend to be a bit a bit more accurate because, uh, well, as Yogi Berra said, uh, making predictions is hard, especially when it's uh, when it's about the future. Now, in this particular case, uh, 
uh, our our back test uh, this this particular model wasn't performing as well over that shorter period. Let's try uh, let's try the default model and look back a little bit more. And we'll compute the uh, back test score again. Uh, one of the uh, you know an important thing I want to point out is uh, uh, you know you don't have to first of all you don't have to it, it, our, our system is not a black box we're not trying to tell you how to trade we want to enable you to test hypotheses and and provide your insight and uh, in all cases you can run these back tests to check okay how well did it work uh, previously and you can make uh, more informed uh, choices on this forecaster uh, in that case. Uh, again, another, another, another good performance with uh, American Express and uh, uh, Hewlett Packard. Uh, uh, for instance, we're predicting uh, direction correct in that case at uh, uh, 64%. Okay, let me uh, get back now to our uh, presentation. There's two ways to, to get our product. Uh, one is you can go to our website at lucenaresearch.com. And in the upper right-hand corner there, there's a big big orange button. Uh, if you click that, you can uh, enter your contact information, and we'll get in touch with you. And uh, we can offer you a 30-day trial to uh, try out the software for yourself. Uh, we're also on Bloomberg. Uh, we have two uh, apps that are available through the Bloomberg terminal. One is called Q4, which is this forecaster that I just showed you. Another is uh, uh, QOpt, which uh, is an optimizer, and we'll uh, we'll we'll talk about uh, uh, we'll talk about that in a in a future webinar. Let me uh, turn now to uh, questions, and I'll I'll check our uh, check out our questions here. We'll go through this. Uh, so first question, will this webinar be available online for review? Yes, absolutely. We're recording it and we'll put the video up. Uh, another question, the back test score for a given stock is closely correlated with the volatility and is the dominant factor. Uh, it is certainly the case that when a stock is more volatile, it's likely to touch a forecast price, but it's also less likely to land uh, in the direction that we forecast. So volatility certainly plays into it, but it you know is a provides both sort of a positive effect and sometimes a, a negative effect. Um, what is your training set and what is your validation set? So in the, um, the in this particular backtest scoring we uh, the the training set is the data that's available before the test day so if for instance if we're looking back over two months we roll back time to uh, uh, we roll back time to two months ago we make a prediction using previous data uh, looking forward say one or two weeks uh, and then we test that uh, prediction. So the uh, the training set is always prior to the particular day of the historical forecast, and the uh, validation is stepping forward. So it's it's out of sample testing. Uh, another question: Do we use other algorithms beside? K nearest neighbor. Uh, presently, we do. We uh, we use both uh, K nearest neighbor and random forests for different parts of our different parts of our system. Oh, the next question is: How does the big background job select features? Is it from a particular set we have defined, or does it involve some sort of unsupervised feature learning? Uh, and this will be the last question I have an opportunity to answer, uh, but that's a that's a that's a great question that uh, shows a lot of insight. Uh, what we do is uh, 
we have about 180 features now that we use uh, uh, to, to pick our set from. And uh, we use a heuristic method uh, that's called uh, uh, forward feature selection. And the way it works is the following. We, we find the very best feature that works the best just by itself. And we choose that one, we add that to our set. Then we try that feature in combination with every other feature. And when we find the, uh, the one that when we add it to that previous one provides the most predictive ability, we keep it. So now we've got two features. And we repeatedly do that, adding one feature at a time, as long as the quality of the prediction continues to improve. Eventually, when we add one more feature, it, uh, it quits improving, and so we stop there. And that's how we uh, that's how we arrive on our set of features. Okay, let me um, let me close now. We're at our target of about uh, forty minutes. I uh, really appreciate your attention. If there were, uh, I know there were additional questions we weren't able to uh, get to. We appreciate your we appreciate your questions, um, and we'll uh, we'll go through the question log and, and get back with you individually. Um, thanks for your uh, thanks for your attention there. Uh, let me close. We're Lucenta Research. You can find us on the web at lucentaresearch.com. And uh, you can contact me by email to tucker at lucentaresearch.com. And I'll be glad to uh, get back to you. Uh, thanks very much. And uh, we've got another web webinar coming out uh, in about two weeks that's going to focus on some of our other products. And we'll send everybody uh, who attended today an invitation to that upcoming webinar. Uh, thanks so much for your attention, and uh, we look forward to uh, 